So now it's uh, my honor to introduce Jacob Wobrock, who is the keynote speaker in, at uh, our workshop, Human 20. The keynote speech this year is entitled Hypertext Social Media and Civic Engagement, How Hypertext is Ruining the World and Might Just Have Saved uh, save It. It is brought to you by Jacob Wobrock, a professor of human computer interaction uh, in the information school and by courtesy in the Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington, which is ranked by the US News as the 10th best university in the world. Jacob's work seeks to scientifically understand people's experiences of computers and information and to improve those experiences through design and engineering, especially for people with disabilities. His specific research topics include input and interaction techniques, human performance measurement and modeling, HCI research and design methods, mobile computing and accessible computing. He has co-authored about 160 peer-reviewed publications and received 25 paper awards, including seven best paper papers and eight honorable mentions from ACM Chi, the flagship conference in HCI. He was named the most influential scholar in HCI by the Chinese citation ranking system A minor for 2018 and runner up for 2020. He was also uh, uh, introduced to the prestigious Kai Academy in 2019. His advisees have been hired at Harvard, Cornell, Colorado, Washington, Brown, Simon Fraser, and elsewhere. Jacob started his academic career with a Bachelor of Science with honors in symbolic systems and a Master of Science in Computer Science from Stanford University in 1998 and 2000, respectively. He received a PhD in human computer interaction from Carnegie Mellon in 2006. Upon graduation, he was honored with CMU School of Computer Science Distinguished Dissertation Award. So several other pointers could have been mentioned in this introduction. They all show that it is a great honor to have Jacob Wobrock as a keynote speaker for the Human 20 workshop. So thank you very much, Jacob, for being, uh, for being among us and for uh, giving your keynote speech today. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. And thank you to the organizers, Klaus and Jessica, for putting on the Human Workshop. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be invited. Um, my name is Jacob Wobrock, and today I will be talking to you about hypertext, social media, and civic engagement, how hypertext is ruining the world and might just save it. I suppose I'm a fan of dramatic titles. So first, just a few quick notes about who I am and where I come from. I live and work in Seattle, Washington, in the United States, where I'm a professor at the University of Washington. We also affectionately call this UW. And Seattle and UW are beautiful places. I hope you can come visit sometime. If you do, please look me up. I'd love to give you a tour. And this is what my campus looked like in the spring a year before the COVID-19 pandemic forced all of us to work from home. I have a number of involvements at the University of Washington. I am a professor in the information school and a courtesy appointment in the Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering. I'm a member of the cross-campus dub group, uh, which stands for design, use, and build. It's the HCI uh, group uh, that is, is one of the top and largest communities of HCI worldwide. My own lab is called the ACE Lab for Accessible Computing Experiences. I'm a co-PI on access computing, which seeks to broaden participation in computing disciplines by people with disabilities. And I co-founded and co-direct a new research center called the UW Center for Research and Education on Accessible Technology and Experiences, uh, which is uh, thus far funded by Microsoft. Much of my work entails studying people's interactions with technology and inventing new ways for improving those interactions. Recently, I've been studying online news credibility, particularly the visual properties that make news seem credible or questionable to users. And I had a paper at Hypertext 2019 on this topic, which is how I met Klaus. 
And I must say, this is still my favorite conference that I've ever attended to date. I hope to come back to another one in the future. Uh, one caveat about my talk today, although the issues I'll be talking about are very much global in nature, um, much of my talk will focus on the United States, simply because that's what I know best and because that's where the phenomena I'll be talking about seem most pronounced in many cases. So let's dive in. It won't surprise you to hear that our world today faces many tremendous problems. Global warming and carbon emissions are sharply rising. The COVID-19 pandemic is raging in the United States. I'm sad to report we recently exceeded 200,000 new cases of coronavirus in a single day. Extreme poverty is on the decline worldwide, but still represents a massive challenge and an ongoing failure of states to provide basic necessities for their people. Widening income inequality has dramatically increased, especially in, in the United States. It constitutes a threat to stability. I'm sad to report the US now has the highest level of income inequality among the G7 countries. The U.S. has also been at war now for its longest period in history, nearly 20 years in Afghanistan. And recent surveys show that a majority now of U.S. military veterans, 58%, in fact, say that the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were not worth fighting. Although ISIS has been set back by U.S. and coalition efforts, violent religious extremism is still a global threat. And of course, in the United States and parts of Europe, we have our own dangerous versions of ideological extremism and fundamentalism and white supremacy. In the United States, racial discrimination, police brutality, police killings of unarmed black people and clashes between alt-right militias and Antifa groups have reached a fever pitch. And mental health crises are on the rise in American university campuses, especially among female students. Now, at this point, you might be wondering, what does any of this have to do with the human factors of hypertext? Well, hang in there with me for a moment. We'll get there and I'll show you. But I want you to remember that Douglas Engelbart predicted that the complexity and urgency of our society's problems would only increase and if we could augment people's intellectual capabilities with better tools, we would be better positioned to solve these complex, urgent problems. He wrote in 1962, man's population and gross product are increasing at a considerable rate, but the complexity of his problems grows still faster and the urgency with which solutions must be found becomes steadily greater in response to the increased rate of activity and the increasingly global nature of that activity. Well, clearly the problems are with us, but do we have the tools to solve them as Engelbart would have hoped? These problems require massive coordinated solutions, but I'm sad to say that we're getting worse at working together. In the United States and elsewhere, we are more polarized on political issues than ever before. This plot shows that over the last 15 years, Americans' opinions on policy questions diverge most now by political party affiliation, far more than by race, religious attendance, education level, age, or gender. Similarly, Americans are more emotionally polarized than ever before. This plot shows that over the last 20 years, Americans' feelings towards their own political party have remained relatively stable, but their feelings about the opposing party have become increasingly negative, cold, or even hostile. And the rise in tactics of far-right populist and nationalist leaders in the US, Brazil, the UK, Hungary, Poland, and elsewhere are both a sign of discontent and a cause of increased tensions and political stalemates. In short, we have lost our collective abilities to solve major problems together. In fact, we've lost our collective abilities to even discuss our problems constructively. 
Now, having many different opinions is one thing, but we can't even agree on facts in many cases. For example, we have on the one hand, the American Centers for Disease Control recommending masks to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And on the other hand, the main coronavirus advisor to President Trump until recently, Dr. Scott Atlas telling the public that masks don't work at all. We can't even agree on facts, which brings me to a related point, which is that unfortunately millions of people no longer view science as authoritative. Pronounced examples are the COVID-19 pandemic, vaccinations and the anti-vaxxer movement, and humans' contributions to global warming. A new report by the Center for Countering Digital Hate has lambasted social media companies for allowing the anti-vaccine movement to remain on their platforms, this report says. Other statistics show that 97% of scientists say humans are responsible for global warming. That's a tremendous scientific consensus. We also seem unable to have constructive disagreement without vilifying our political opponents. What's, what's telling about this though, is that both sides feel unfairly vilified by the other side. It's not just one direction. It seems we simply won't or can't work together anymore to resolve our differences and solve these major problems that we face. Some of you have made, maybe heard of David Brooks. He's a longtime American political and social columnist for the New York Times. He's also a lifelong Republican party member. And despite his political affiliation, he recently released an op-ed piece with a provocative title, The Rotting of the Republican Mind. In it, Brooks illuminates our inability to work together and what drives this inability. Now, normally in my talks, I'm reluctant to, to read text uh, in long passages like this, but in this case, I actually think it's worth it. So let's do this together. I've highlighted some places that I think are especially important. And if you'd read along with me, that would be great. In a recent survey, Brooks writes, 77% of Trump backers said Joe Biden had won the president, presidential election because of fraud, 77%. Many of these same people think that climate change is not real. Many of these same people believe they don't need to listen to scientific experts on how to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. We live in a country, that is the US, in epistemological crisis in which much of the Republican party has become detached from reality. Moreover, this is not just an American problem. All around the world, rising right-wing populist parties are floating on oceans of misinformation and falsehood. What's going on? Brooks goes on to say that over the past decades, the information age has created a lot more people who make their living working with ideas. I'd say that's all of us at this workshop right now, for sure. People who are professional members of this epistemic process. The information economy has increasingly rewarded them with money and status it has increasingly concentrated them in ever more prosperous metro areas. While these cities have been prospering, places where fewer people have college degrees have been spiraling down. Flatter incomes, decimated families and dissolved communities. In 1972, so about 50 years ago, people without college degrees were nearly as happy as those with college degrees, but now, those without a degree are far more unhappy about their lives. People in this precarious state are going to demand stories that will both explain their distrust back to them and also enclose them within a safe community of believers. The evangelists of distrust from Donald Trump to Alex Jones, to the followers of QAnon, which is a conspiracy theory, they rose up to give them those stories and provide that community. Paradoxically, conspiracy theories have become the most effective community bonding mechanisms of the 21st century. For those awash in anxiety and alienation who feel that everything is spinning out of control, conspiracy theories are extremely effective emotional tools. 
For those in low status groups, they provide a sense of superiority. I possess important information most people do not have. For those who feel powerless, they provide agency. I have the power to reject experts and expose hidden cabals. As Cass Sunstein at, of Harvard Law School points out, they provide liberation. If I imagine my foes are completely malevolent, then I can use any tactic against them that I want. Under Trump, the Republican Party is, is defined not by a set of policy beliefs, but by a paranoid mindset. He and his media allies simply ignore the rules of the epistemic regime and have set up a rival trolling regime. The internet is an ideal medium for untested information to get around traditional gatekeepers, but it is an accelerant of the paranoia, not its source. Distrust and precarity caused by economic, cultural, and spiritual threat are the source. The need for stories, for community, for security, and for trust all feature prominently as underlying needs in David Brooks' account. And the internet is the place that people are meeting these needs. As he said again, the internet is an ideal medium for untested information to get around traditional gatekeepers. So how does this untested information actually spread? Well, that brings me to social media platforms where misinformation can spread more quickly than truth and actually studies show it usually does. Fake news is one form of misinformation that travels quite widely on social media. My colleague at the University of Washington, Jevin West, who studies the online spread of misinformation, he often starts his talks with this graph from Craig Silverman's study of the 2016 presidential election in the US. Silverman showed that during that election, there were for the first time more engagements with fake news than mainstream news on Facebook quite alarming. And we know that fake news played a big role in that 2016 American presidential election, generally by promoting articles that favored Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton. In an ironic twist, it has actually since then been Donald Trump claiming that reports of the influence of fake news on his election are themselves the fake news. In the three months leading up to the US presidential election in 2016, 30 million fake news stories were shared on Facebook by those favoring Trump and 8 million were shared by those favoring Clinton in just three months. It will be interesting to see these types of data for the recent 2020 election when they become available. But it's not just fake news that spreads. Conspiracy theories also spread like wildfire on social media. I don't know if you've heard of the 5G coronavirus conspiracy theory. But it says that 5G towers, like you see in this picture, cause or at least can be linked to the coronavirus. Again, my colleague, Dr. West and his colleagues collected 400 million tweets about COVID and coronavirus as of early April. Uh, these were all of the Twitter conversations about COVID-19 and coronavirus at, uh, at the time. And within his collection of 400 million tweets, more than 5 million were about this 5G coronavirus uh, conspiracy theory. That means more than one in every 100 tweets about coronavirus at that time were about a single totally false conspiracy theory. That is incredibly alarming. James Temperton wrote uh, the, the best known article in Wired magazine on the 5G conspiracy theory. And some of his quotes are quite alarming and point really to the power of social media in spreading this conspiracy theory. He says, some weeks later, this conspiracy theory started to break out propelled by engagement algorithms that were smart enough to spot a viral trend, but dumb enough not to notice the idiocy of its content. From those obscure beginnings, the conspiracy theory has now been pushed by celebrities with hundreds of thousands or millions of social media followers. Scientifically baseless comments don't exist in a vacuum. In fact, they exist in a sludge of conspiracy theories that have been shared millions of times on social media. Like anti-vax content, this messaging is spreading via platforms 
which have been designed explicitly to help propagate the content which people find most compelling and most irresistible to click on. So how do these lies actually spread? Well, that was the focus of an issue of science in 2018. This is the cover of that issue. It contained a highly cited article called The Science of Fake News, which also contains some quotes that are worth reading quickly. And I've highlighted some pretty alarming phrases. About 47% of Americans report getting news from social media often or sometimes with Facebook as the most dominant source. Social media are key conduits for fake news. Social networks reduce tolerance for alternative views. They amplify attitudinal polarization. They boost the likelihood of accepting ideological compatible news and increase closure to new information. Dislike of the other side, affective polarization has also risen. We saw that with a graph I showed you just recently. These trends have created a context in which fake news can attract a mass audience. Another study reported that false information on Twitter is typically retweeted by many more people and far more rapidly than true information, especially when the topic is politics. I also know from my colleague, uh, Jevin West, that corrections uh, and fact-checking reaches far fewer people than the original lies ever reached. Mediation of much fake news via social media might accentuate its effect because of the implicit endorsement that comes with sharing. We also are full of biases, we being people. People prefer information that confirms their pre-existing attitudes called selective exposure bias. We view information consistent with our pre-existing beliefs as more persuasive than dissonant information called confirmation bias. And we're inclined to accept information that pleases us, which is called desirability bias. We're all very prone to these biases and they're alive and well on social media. Moreover, we're more likely to accept familiar information as true. So there's the risk that even repeating false information in a fact-checking context may increase an individual's likelihood for accepting it as true. A paper by my UW colleague, Francisca Rosner and her students showed that most people investigate fake news in their social media feeds never. They never investigate it, especially when links to articles were posted by a known source. So fake news, conspiracy theories, and falsehoods can spread relatively unchecked. And of course, this list of social media woes would not be complete without reference to an American president who tweets regularly to 90 million followers, many of whom take his word as truth without question. Trump's tweets have exacerbated political polarization, promulgated fake news, heightened racial tensions, contributed to the rejection of shared truths, including facts of science and medicine, which should greatly concern us. This tweet here, uh, the uh, Washington Post voted to be his single most harmful tweet to those who would follow his advice when he said, don't be afraid of COVID, don't let it dominate your life, no big deal here, nothing to see here. So with this unchecked spread of misinformation infecting the body of our online discourse, I wanna ask what is its connective tissue? What draws it all together and allows it to spread so easily? Well, friends, it's hyperlinks. It's that ingenious invention that allows us to connect information or misinformation and spread it widely through social media platforms, which after all are hypermedia platforms. And it makes all of these ills possible that we've seen. Let's go back to our roots, way back to our roots. Here's an excerpt from Vannevar Bush's classic 1945, Envisioning Peace on the Memex. I'm sure you've read it probably many times like I have, but let me read this excerpt and then highlight a few things. It's telling how we can see the beginnings of these problems, even back in some of the features he described. He said, the memex affords an immediate step to associative indexing, the basic idea of which is that any item may be caused to select immediately and automatically another item. This is the essential feature of the memex. 
The process of tying two items together is the important thing. It is more than this, for any item can be joined into numerous trails. It's an interesting trail, pertinent to the discussion, so the user sets a reproducer in action, copies the whole trail out, and passes it to his friend for insertion in his own memics, there to be linked into the more general trail. Wholly new forms of encyclopedias will appear, ready-made with a mesh of associative trails running through them, ready to be dropped into the memics and there amplified. What an inspiring vision indeed. But here we see the seeds of the problems. Let me highlight some phrases and extrapolate some of the issues we're seeing. He says, to select immediately and automatically another item. Well, this instant gratification we know can lead to social media addiction, compulsive use, and doom scrolling, where despite all the bad news we're seeing, we keep on scrolling and can't give it up. It's an interesting trail, pertinent to the discussion, he says. Well, what is interesting to a user? We've just seen we are very much prone to these biases, selective exposure bias, confirmation bias, and desirability bias, which govern what we find interesting and are willing to share. He passes it to his friend for insertion in his own memics. Oh, the word friend, that should ring uh, differently to us today. This is sharing and liking and friending and following on social media platforms. They're to be linked into the more general trail. Well, these are social media feeds that are visible to so many people. Wholly new forms of encyclopedias will appear. Encyclopedias are knowledge, except now we know we have knowledge, so-called knowledge held by a select few, conspiracy theories insider knowledge of the kind David Brooks described. And there, it's all amplified, folks, amplified by repeated sharing and liking. It's a sad irony that what Bush envisioned as a means to connect people to facts, knowledge, and the wonders and record of science now has become a vehicle for the spread of falsehoods, conspiracies, and acutely unscientific alternate realities. Okay, so I know that's been a pretty heavy load of negativity so far. I've given you 46 slides to feel pretty bad, um, but that's where we are today. Um, we've lost our collective abilities to work together to solve big problems. Social media is providing a platform for amplifying misinformation and sowing division. And it's all connected by and spreading easily because of the ingenious invention of hyperlinks and everything we can do with them. So what can be done? Well, it's not all bad news. First, let's remember that social media is hypermedia. Everything in social media connects to somewhere or someone else, including not just textual links, but images and videos as well. I'd be hard pressed to click on anything in either of these interfaces from Facebook and Twitter and not be instantly connected to something or someone else. And I don't have to tell any of you in this audience that hypermedia interfaces have tremendous power. If hyperlinks can connect people to misinformation, they can also connect people to true information. So how can we use this power for good? Well, as I said, hyperlinks have the power to connect us to truth. Donald Trump here says, I won this election by a lot, but Twitter has started flagging content that it deems false or misleading. Many of Donald Trump's tweets about his own re-election success were flagged by Twitter with hyperlinks leading to authoritative news com content. So Twitter adds this link and then it takes you to a, uh, another screen showing actually authoritative news content on that topic. Another example is when uncertainty arose about Wisconsin's registered voters and the number of votes cast. Although Twitter itself, didn't clarify these concerns, other people quickly cleared up confusions with hyperlinks leading to authoritative content. Here's an example of a woman asking for facts and she's provided with an article that's a fact check. Wisconsin did not have more votes than registered voters. Here's another example where a woman provides a link 
for those wondering about this issue to in fact the Wisconsin Elections Commission so people can see the data for themselves. These are powerful examples of hyperlinks leading us to truth, not misinformation. Hypertext interfaces can also debunk conspiracy theories. Remember the 5G coronavirus conspiracy theory I was just telling you about? Well, links to authoritative news articles debunking this conspiracy theory helped tamp down the spread of that theory, like this example from a link to the observer. Hypertext interfaces can also indicate the credibility of information. My colleague at the UW Information School, Tanushri Mitra, and her collaborators created Feed Reflect, a browser plugin that augments your Twitter feed with visual cues to nudge you to more carefully consider the hyperlinked news articles that appear in your feed. Feed Reflect emphasizes news links that come from reliable sources, coloring them, say, green, and de-emphasizes news links that come from questionable sources, say fading them out. I'll show you an example in just a moment. Reliable sources that prompt questions by others in their feeds uh, are colored yellow to indicate uh, that users might look further into the issue. Users can also rate the credibility of these news sources along a variety of dimensions. Here's a little video that shows you some of these features. So this is a user's Twitter feed, and you can see here that uh, there's a tooltip providing information as to why the tweets are faded out or colored yellow. Yellow means credible, but they're questions to be pursued. Green is credible without such questions. And these faded articles uh, indicate questionable or unreliable sources. And you can also see up here, there's the opportunity to rate articles uh, along a number of dimensions for their credibility and content. Facebook also has taken to graying over posts that have been deemed false information by independent fact checkers. It says false information checked by independent fact checkers and a button to see why if you want to know more. These are pretty unprecedented moves by social media platforms to take these steps. Hypertext interfaces can also gather a range of ideas from across the opinion spectrum, giving people multiple points of view to consider. Research systems like NewsCube, Considerate, and Counterweight have created hypertextual interfaces that allow users to explore a range of articles, opinions, and ideas. For a time, the Wall Street Journal did something similar they showed liberal and conservative Facebook posts side by side in a feature they called Blue Feed, Red Feed. It's still available, but it's, uh, it's been archived, but you can find it. Here's what the interface looked like for the topic of the US budget. So two Facebook feeds side by side on the same topic from different points of view. All of these hyperlinked interfaces can help curtail the spread of misinformation and promote truth over falsehood. But if we're gonna work together, to really work together across ideological divides, there still lingers an underlying issue of trust. An underlying issue of trust. What about trust? Can we trust each other if we're to work with each other? Remember that David Brooks article I showed you a few slides back? What I didn't show you was the last paragraph of his article where he offers some insight into how to address the problems he's observed. He says, what to do? You can't argue people out of paranoia. If you try to point out factual errors, you only entrench false belief. The only solution is to reduce the distrust and anxiety that is the seedbed of this thinking. And that can only be done First, by contact, reducing the social chasm between the members of the epistemic regime and those who feel so alienated from it. And second, it can be done by policy, by making life more secure for those without a college degree. Rebuilding trust, Brooks says, is obviously the work of a generation. I would argue we don't have time. We need to do it faster than a whole generation. But I take his point. Trust is social. So can social media foster trust? That might sound like a stretch, but let's consider the question. 
Well, first we gotta ask, what are the foundations of trust? Psychologists used to think of trust as a mere attitude of a person, but I've come to see trust like Brooks has as fundamentally relational, not about individuals, but about relationships between individuals and between individuals and organizations. The eminent Polish sociologist Piotr Stromka formulated a definition of trust. He said, trust is a bet about the future contingent actions of others. And for Stromka, trust had three components. Reputation is about past deeds. Performance is about current deeds or present conduct. And appearance is visual appearance, but also including civility and manners, how we conduct ourselves in those ways. All three of these factors are present on social media. If you think of Twitter, reputation can be visible in a person's tweet history. Performance is about their current tweet and what they're doing with it. And appearance is about their profile picture, banner choices, and also their civility and manners during exchanges. So how can trust play a role in our online interactions? My colleague, Alexis Hineker and her PhD student, Amanda Bond, who led the project I'm about to describe, conducted a study to see if respectful behavior could affect online discourse on Twitter and build respect and trust. And Bond sent me this summary of her work. She says, we conducted a controlled experiment on Twitter, systematically varying respectful versus neutral language. Notice it's not respectful versus disrespectful language. It's respectful versus just neutral language with in-group versus out-group conversations. In-group being people with whom you identify as being part of your identity and your group outgroup being people across some ideological divide. We found that respectful language diminishes the effects of in-group bias. Remember those biases we saw? Well, respectful language in an in-group setting diminishes those biases. It also improves the quality of discourse overall by reducing shaming language and increasing respectful language. Let's see some of this in action. I'm gonna show you some examples and I'll explain them. I'm not gonna read all the text here, um, but David Pratt, where the orange arrow is pointing, is actually Amanda Bond, the researcher I just told you about. Uh, David's reply in this thread offers neutral but pointed disagreement. In fact, all of the tweets I'm gonna show you are showing disagreement with the topic being discussed, usually politics. Uh, David Pratt starts his reply with, I disagree and goes into the rationale. There's nothing overtly disrespectful by any means, it's just neutral, but there's just pointed disagreement. And in response to that disagreement, he gets, all I can say is you're an idiot. Not very constructive. Here's another example of neutral disagreement language. Brian Haworth is also Amanda Bond, the researcher. And Brian's reply is again, neutral, but pointed disagreement, starting with, I disagree. It's not disrespectful, but it's not particularly respectful or showing any kind of empathy. And the response is to call him a ridiculous cult member. And again, neutral but pointed disagreement from David Pratt without showing any particular signs of overt respect or empathy results in an uncharitable rebuke. It's sad that there are people like you who believe the crap you just wrote seek help. Okay, here are some respectful examples on the other side of the experiment. They all still show disagreement. That's important to point out. They're not considered nicer because they agree. They're all still disagreement. The facts of the substantive arguments are the same, but they begin with, I respect your views instead of just, I disagree. And then they proceed to their objections. And note the responses elicited, which are much more respectful in return. This woman says, I have never responded to anyone on Twitter, so excuse me if I don't reply further, but I thank you for disagreeing respectfully. Here's another one where we see respectful disagreement and a disagreeing response, but it's also a kind response. I appreciate your kind answer. I appreciate your kindness, even though the respondent disagrees. 
And again, a respectful but disagreeing post from the researcher elicits respectful disagreement from the other party and also an acknowledgement of the rights of everyone to express their views in a democracy. The respondent writes, we both just beg to differ, but after all, that's what a democracy is about. Very different in tone with very minimal changes to the researchers' posts. So what we've just seen are examples of how respectful online discourse, even disagreement, uh, can elicit respectful responses, in some cases even enhanced empathy and possibly a little bit of trust. But Twitter doesn't do anything to encourage this kind of interaction. If anything, by promoting tweets that elicit strong reactions, Twitter encourages the opposite. You've probably heard the phrase viral outrage. You've probably never heard the phrase viral trust or viral understanding. That just isn't a thing. So how can we design interfaces to promote trust and understanding? Well, my colleague Alexis Hineker is rethinking online social interactions and exploring new interfaces to encourage exactly that, to encourage trust and empathy building. Here's a sketch of a mobile social media app she's creating to foster trust and healthy relationships online. Let me just show you some of the features she's considering. Uh, it's not built yet, it's in the design and development process, but it shows the kind of rethinking that's interesting here. She con contemplates a common ground highlighting tool to allow the two participants in a conversation to highlight sections of a passage that they both agree on. And she has buttons, but not just like buttons or dislike buttons, she has buttons for apologize and forgive to make these essential expressions more accessible and lower stakes to use. Can you imagine a social media platform with apologize and forgive buttons? It's very different than we're used to. She also imagines a vulnerability mode, which toggles the message such that when it's posted, its visual appearance changes to show, hey, Writing this was a little hard for me. I feel a little vulnerable saying this, but I'm trying to be authentic. Please don't jump down my throat. She also prohibits autocomplete or prompted phrases so that both sides know everything written is indeed written authentically. She considers text suggestions and detection of text that is in second person language because that erodes constructive discourse and instead offers suggestions for first person language, which can build constructive discourse. And using other forms of natural language processing to detect negative affect and uh, commands and that second person language to give an interpersonal score to a message out of say 10, uh, that can be then uh, increased by changing the tone of the message and perhaps offer even suggestions for helping the user to do that. This is just one example of how we might reimagine the purpose and form of our online social interactions and shrink this divide of disrespect. And that brings me to my final thought and back to Douglas Engelbart, who, as we all know, inspired us to think about how to augment human capabilities through powerful tools when it comes to social media and online interactions, can we think about augmenting not just our own personal capabilities, but what we might call our civic capabilities? Now, if this sounds like a little bit of a stretch from Engelbart's vision, I'd actually beg to differ. He was always concerned with solving society's biggest problems. He saw boosting our collective intelligence as a means of doing this. Here's some excerpts uh, that he wrote. Uh, the highlighted parts, he says, we need to find solutions to problems that before seemed insoluble. And by complex situations, he includes the professional problems of diplomats, executives, social scientists, life scientists, physical scientists, attorneys, and designers. He says, if we can augment man's intellect, that would warrant full pursuit by an enlightened society. And that the objective of his work and study is in meeting the various needs of society for problem solving in its most general sense and to develop new techniques, procedures, and systems that will better match these basic capabilities to the needs, problems, and progress of society. And Vannevar Bush 
He also foresaw the use of hyperlinked information systems to the application of large scale societal problems. From the very beginning of envisioning hypertext information systems, the system's abilities to augment our collective civic capabilities really were part of that vision. He says that we need to analyze more completely and objectively our present problems, that we have built a civilization so complex that we need to mechanize our record of knowledge more fully if we're to push this experiment of civilization to its logical conclusion. He goes on to say that the applications of science may yet allow us to truly encompass the great record of our knowledge and to grow in wisdom, yet in the application of science to the needs and desires of our society, it would seem to be a singularly unfortunate stage at which to terminate the process or to lose hope as to the outcome. And I wholeheartedly agree, we must not lose hope as to the outcome, despite all of the problems that I have described today. We must not lose hope and continue working for the good. I wanna leave you with a call to action. And to do that, I have a little story for us. You've maybe heard this story. I didn't write it from scratch myself. On her first day of work, a newly hired research scientist at a prestigious laboratory joins her colleagues from different fields around the lunch table. And as conversation unfolds, she asks, what are the most important problems in each of your various fields? The scientists all take their turn answering. When everyone is finished, the new hire asks for a show of hands. Okay, so how many of you are currently working on the problems you just described? And no hands go up. I'm guilty of this, perhaps you are too, but we can all do better with the blessings of intelligence and education, science and technology, and our research communities. And we must take full advantage of them all if we're to solve these difficult problems that we face. And there are so many problems that matter. At the start of this talk, I opened with this list and there are many more. So I wanna ask us now, what can we do in our work to improve upon any one of these problems? How can we connect people to true information that improves their lives? How can we foster trust, encourage empathy, and promote constructive dialogue in our hyperlinked social media spaces? I will leave you to consider these questions for your own work. And I want to acknowledge Alexis Henniker, Amanda Bond, Jevin West, Tanushri Mitra, and Amy Zhang from the University of Washington, my dear colleagues, and also to acknowledge the Center for an Informed Public at the University of Washington, which does important work in areas related to the topic of today's talk. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much for giving this uh, very interesting and uh, compelling keynote to a very important topic uh, worldwide, actually, not just uh, the US. So um, we have some minutes left for questions. Actually, maybe I can start with one uh, question. I have a, a, a number of questions actually written down on my paper. So this would be actually a, an evening to talk mm -hmm. about. But uh, if, you, if you talk about um, trust and if you talk about um, the indication of credibility, um, isn't this just uh, the same problem we have today so that uh, machines basically would kind of detect what is right and what is wrong. So AI basically uh, would get the burden of deciding what is right and what is wrong. Um, if you, if you um, talk about people rating tweets, um, wouldn't this be just uh, uh, something uh, people you know, would do in the in same fashion as, as they retweet? So you can actually you know, rate tweets in a bad way as well, or you could basically do this on purpose, you know, telling people the uh, not not the truth, uh, so basically lying at people as we see on on many tweets. So isn't this just the same problem at a different level? Yeah, that's a great question, and I I will say, Klaus, I wish nothing more than we could sit for an evening over a few good German beers and discuss these face to face. We will. Uh, maybe we can do that soon, uh, my friend. 
Uh, it's a great question. And I think you're right that the same biases uh, can be at work, but uh, a lot of studies show that the more that we can promote people to reflect and consider the content through the prompts that we might give them, uh, that it actually goes a long way to de destroying the biases that are at work. Um, and that's why, uh, in particular, that one system I showed you the video for from Tanushri Mitra, um, Feed Reflect, has in its name the word reflect. Uh, it, it seems uh, from, from social psychology and other studies that uh, reflection itself and causing people just to consider things like the source of the article and does it seem objective, does it seem complete, who else seems to have liked this or not, and so on that kind of reflection can actually help break down some of the biases that are at work. It's not going to be perfect, but it begins to help us uh, do more than just, for example, retweet things without even reading them. Um, that study I mentioned by Francisco Rosner uh, showed that people will uh, often share things without ever even reading the article they're sharing, perhaps just from the title um, or even just from an image that comes with the article. And, and that's enough of a reason to share without any reflection or inspection at all. So if we can promote more reflection and inspection, uh, it can go some way to helping the problem. It's by no means the full solution, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take the second one real briefly first, which is I think that uh, it, it is amazing for all the expressions possible on social media. Um, uh, we have very little in the way, especially on Twitter, of, of showing various reasons why we might retweet or why we might like something. A like doesn't really necessarily mean like at all. It might just be uh, showing an interest, perhaps because it's negative, um, as you said. So more expressive um, badges and things might be might be of some use. C certain other platforms explore that. As far as your first comment, boy, that's that's also one worthy of at least a, a, a few hours and a few beers. But um, the, you know, theologically, putting the theology aside and theological considerations aside, uh, we know that religions provide for people much of what David Brooks was referring to in his article, uh, a sense of stories that unite people unite history, um, community, and a sense of trust, a sense of uh, belonging, and so on. And so those properties really aren't exclusive to theological claims, are they? Um, and conspiracy theories, especially that develop those communities and those stories and those ways of belonging and being on the in-group, uh, really do manifest those kinds of properties that Brooks was describing. Um, it's going to be interesting, especially in light of the US Supreme Court ruling that you were talking about, to see uh, how religions really become defined because uh, there are properties in QAnon of religious type uh, behavior and thinking, but I don't think at this point, at least we'd call it formally a religion, um, even if the behavior seems to ex exemplify at least the, the kind of cult style that we, uh, of religions that we see. And so over time, that's going to have to develop and mature. Uh, and of course, um, it, it's not about facts and logic, right? As Brooks said, it becomes much more about um, those emotive aspects of belonging and community and trust and stories and narratives that tie people together. So if we're going to address those things, I think we have to operate at that level. And I know that 
uh, from my time at Hypertext 2019, there's a whole part of this community that's very invested in story and hyper narratives and things that uh, connect across all sorts of um, paths. And I'm learning more about that. I'm, I'm probably not even describing it quite right, but I think there could be an interesting avenue for research there as well to connect people through narratives that are not just in their traditional form. I think we had two more questions. Manolis, you raised your hand. Uh, yes, Klaus, thank you very much, Klaus. Um, I liked uh, the talk very much. It was very, very interesting. Uh, and uh, although a little bit too heavy for a Friday afternoon, I think uh, the questions raised were valid and very, very serious. My question now is the following. How should we answer in a technological way when someone throws the free speech card? Okay. Okay. And this argument, the free speech argument. Okay. Saying, for example, okay, this is the internet. Everything can be said. Everything that you like can be said. Every, every, everyone probably works on equal footing. Okay, and let the let the opinions uh, fight each other and see what comes out. So, the, the, my first question is, how should the how should someone respond again in a technological sense, uh, uh, from a tools perspective, mm. the, the the free speech argument, which is probably something that uh, many deniers uh, refer to, mm -hmm. and. The second question is the following, whether or not censoring, all right, certain uh, opinions uh, like we have seen in Twitter or in Facebook uh, creates more harm than good, okay? And I would like to connect this with the first question there. Yeah. So I guess that's the reason why, for example, one interesting solution that you proposed in your talk is, for example, uh, to show to users all the available opinions, okay, so there are different viewpoints of that thing, so that in order to see a more complete, of course, not the big picture or the complete picture, uh, at least to somehow make them aware that there are some other opinions. And that's the yeah. reason, and I guess such solutions um, do you, uh, are appropriate because they don't use censoring, which I, I think censoring uh, will uh, function in a completely opposite way. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, you said my talk was heavy. Your questions are, are also heavy. And uh, you're closer to uh, to the time for the, the pub than I am. I'm, I'm at uh, six in the morning. So it's too early for me to figure this out over a beer. I keep referring to, to beer, I guess. Maybe I wish I was in Germany right now. Um, yeah, so... Uh, especially in the U.S., of course, with our First Amendment, free speech is something that uh, we talk about a lot and is a very powerful ongoing notion in American society, as I think it should be. Um, but you asked specifically about a technological response. That is really tough. Um, censoring does tend to have a certain kind of backlash. You know, um, there have been uh, quite a few movements of particular folks from the mainstream platforms of Facebook and Twitter over to platforms like Parlay uh, and others that um, are, are not going to ever flag or censor anything is their commitment to the users. Um, and that just further reinforces their echo chambers and like-minded group think, which um, we've seen is, is quite dangerous. I mean, we don't have to have social media to know that group think is dangerous um, from history. Um, but um, I think we, we have to allow that all ideas can be expressed, but I think we also have to allow that not all ideas have equal merit and um, not all ideas are true. <laughs> you know, all opinions are, uh, you know, allowable in some sense, but not all facts are true. And I do th commend the, the platforms uh, like Twitter for including uh, links, for example, under uh, Trump's tweets that were demonstrably false. They didn't censor the tweets, they didn't take them out, but they included uh, those connections to more reliable reporting. Um, I don't think that that's going to solve the problem because people who don't wanna believe it won't believe it anyway, but at least it begins to show that there's more at work here than just rampant unchecked free speech. And 
not all not all facts have equal merit. True ones should have more weight than false ones. So calling that out, I think, is important. Uh, beyond that, I think that's that's a great research question. You know, what systems can we develop that really I think would combine something about truth and something about trust and community and belonging? I, I really do agree with David Brooks, which is why I included that article. We're not going to um, kind of get on top of these things um, just from a bunch of fact checking and links to reliable articles. You can't argue someone out of their paranoia, like he says in his article. Thank you for the question. I wish I had a more satisfying answer. Um, watching the time, we are running late, but uh, I think we had still one, one last question, um, which I read from uh, the chat. Um, what are your thoughts on annotation layer on content on the internet? Would it help solve um, some of the problems you describe? Additionally, we are yet uh, to see bidirectional links on the internet. What impact would that have on the many issues you raise? I think an annotation layer would be fantastic. I actually developed a startup for many years that I ran as the, the CEO. Um, Uh, where we were annotating the web with with helpful content like uh, help links, not political content, not not uh, discussions and things, but it was an annotation layer that just helped users get their work done. It was called Answer Dash, and so um, I thought a lot about such layers, um, and uh, I haven't really seen anything yet compelling um, that uh, could address this problem. But I think that's a really interesting idea. Uh, allowing a certain kind of discourse to take place on top of the the content and the discourse that's already there can only help promote, I think, further reflection, uh, which does, again, seem to break down some of these um, biases that we all are prone to. Okay, thank you. There's actually just one more question left, uh, I believe. Uh, would you all agree to answer that question? Um, It only takes a few minutes, I guess. I also read it from the chat. I remember when news outlets con, uh, confined their operators' opinions uh, to the editorial pages, uh, now every article is deeply Im uh, imbued with the uh, political bias of its author. Mainstream reporting and social media platforms now work in, the, uh, in concert to blur effects and uh, opinions that don't align with their politics. Is it any wonder that those with different views might perceive uh, this in consp conspirational terms? Yeah, no, it's not really such a surprise, is it? Um, and the, the credibility of the media is very much, um, very much a part of what we have seen. And of course, just like not all facts are equally true, not all media outlets are equally biased or neutral. Um, in fact, preparing this talk, I did a lot of reading about the beginnings of distrust in the media. A lot of it goes back to um, media specialists being involved directly in propaganda efforts during um, some of our world's wars. And so um, we, we have a, a lot of trust to kind of recover. Of course, it doesn't help uh, when Uh, everything is fake news to somebody, 